Welcome back to Kirstie's Virtual Classroom. Today we are talking all about maps. So there are basic types of maps. Most of us are really familiar with things like Google Maps or Google Earth, which shows us the map of the world, basically. So there are world maps that can depict anything. They can be weather, geology, plate boundaries. We'll look at a lot of those, volcanoes. Um, or there can be road maps, which is what most of us use. Um, that shows the location of roads, highways, and major landmarks. And then we've got topographic maps, which are really useful for hiking um, or even mapping geologic features. So they show elevation and some water features. And then geologic maps will show you the geology or the rocks of an area. So down here on the bottom left, we have a topographic map example. And then here in the center, we have a geologic map example. Okay, so uh, topographic maps are two-dimensional um, surfaces or maps that show you a 3D world. So they represent what we see in topography in real world, which is the highs and lows in our surface elevation. And they represent that on just a 2D map that you can hold in your hand. They're also known as contour maps. And the lines that you see on the map are called contour lines, and they show the elevation above sea level. Okay, so the topographic maps in the United States are mapped out using a particular set of um, parameters. So the United States Geological Survey, or the USGS, I'll refer to that a lot throughout the semester, um, puts out topographic maps we call quadrangles. And most of them are what we call a seven and a half minute quadrangle, which is usually on a scale of one to 24,000, which means that for every inch you move on the map, you're moving 24,000 inches in real life. Okay, so from about 1947 to 1992, there were about 55,000 maps made to cover all of the 48 lower states. So um, similar maps are now being produced in other areas like Alaska, Hawaii, and other US territories. Um, but this mapping system is really helpful because it keeps everything on the same um, datum. So everything comes out looking very similar. All of the maps have the same format, same information. I um, mean, it helps uniform all of our topographic maps throughout the United States. So how are maps made? So maps start with finding elevation across a landscape. So you will find particular um, places along a hilltop or along whatever landscape you're looking at. And you'll say, okay, so along this line here is approximately where all of the 1,100 feet of elevation lies. And then from there, you can project it down. So one cool way this can happen is by putting some sort of model in a container and then filling that container with water little by little and mapping out using um, like an acrylic piece or some other tracing um, paper and mapping out where that water hits. And then it'll show you kind of a makeshift elevation and make you a map that then gets translated looking like a topographic map. Okay, we also have raised relief maps which show topography and a few other features, um, like water features, as you can see in this photograph. So raised relief maps are actually a scaled down representation of the landscape in 3D fashion. So there are ridges, as you can tell, and you can run your hand over it. And it does have pockets of rivers, um, ridges, canyons, valleys. It shows you all of those things. All right, so getting into contour lines. So contour lines are a line on the map that connects areas of equal elevation. Okay? They do not give you exact elevation, it's all approximated. So they show you the elevation as well as the shape of the land. It kind of gives you an idea here that there might be a lobe coming out based on how the contour lines are kind of acting right there. They also show you the relief or the, dis the difference excuse me, between high and low elevations. So relief is um, another term a lot of people use for elevation or topography. It shows you the difference between your high and low elevations. Okay, so take a second to try to understand whether you can correlate a particular map to a particular cross section. So remember, cross section is when we cut 
into the mountain. So we're looking at the side of the mountain, not necessarily the top. The map would be the top. Okay, so you can pause this video and see if you can match these up, and then we can continue. Okay, so this one here, moving on, you can tell goes, one goes to B because on the right-hand side of this map, or if this was oriented north, this would be the east side of the map, it's a steeper hill. And so on B, the right side of the cross-section is a steeper hill. How about two? What does two go to? Most likely E, good. So two would go to E, it's an isolated hill. Move it over just a little bit. All right, and three goes to D, where you have pretty equal hills on either side. How about four, what does four go to? Good, so that would be C. The hill is isolated on the left-hand side or on the west. Five would go to F. You see a plateau here. The plateau is also shown in the cross section. And then six would go to A, where you have isolated hills on either side, and the dip between is much greater. So you see how there's many more contour lines here? That means that it's steeper than, for instance, D and three. Okay? So hopefully that made a little bit of sense. All right, so between contour lines, is known as the contour interval. And for each map, it might be different. For the USGS quadrangles, they're mostly all the same. They're mostly all 20 feet. But sometimes I'll give you a simpler map and it might be a contour interval of 10. So here, the way you can figure that out is two contour lines are marked at 700 and 750. And there are four lines between them, five spaces. So in order to go from 700 to 750, you must go in intervals of 10. So if this line is 700, the next line is 710. The line after that would be 720, 730, 740, and then finally 750. So the contour interval, or the difference between two contour lines, is 10 feet for this particular map. Okay, so when we look at some of the USGS maps, they can be very complex, and not as many of the contour lines are marked. But a couple important things to know are that there are index contour lines and then just regular contour lines. So the index contour lines are usually noted what their contour is, and they are these thicker lines. So the index contour lines are your thicker lines, and they're usually rounded to the nearest 10. Okay, so when contour lines are really close together, you'll see a very steep slope. So what this is depicting is that if you have contour lines really close together, you are changing elevation over a very small horizontal distance. So you're going, you're increasing in elevation very quickly, and that's what gives the very steep or sorry, the very closely spaced contour lines. Whereas if they're farther away from each other, that means that over a longer distance, you're gaining this elevation, which would be a more gradual slope. So for instance, if we look at El Capitan, we look at the topographic map of El Capitan, the lines are so close together, they're hardly depicted as individual lines on the map. Same thing for Half Dome, so Half Dome, is a very steep slope, right? Everything around Yosemite Valley is actually a very steep slope. So you can kind of see that all of the lines are so close together in these regions that they can't actually be depicted on the map because it's too small. Okay, so here are some other examples. Here you would see a steep slope. All of those lines are close together and there are more contour lines than this one on the right where it's a gentle slope and there are less contour lines. Another example here, on this left side of the slope, you can see a much steeper grade than on the right. It's more gentle, so that's also depicted in its map. So on the right hand, sorry, the left hand side of the map, the contour lines are much closer together than on the right. Okay, so moving on to widely spaced contour lines. So similar or opposite, closely spaced contour lines show a steep slope, 
So widely spaced contour lines show that you are increasing in elevation over a long period or a, a long horizontal distance. So we would see a gradual or gentle slope when our contour lines are further apart. So if it looks something like this, here we have on the left-hand side or potentially the um, west side, a contour line set up that are really far apart. And then once you get to a certain point, you see contour lines start to get closer and closer together, which means that your elevation is changing drastically over a short distance. So it'd be a steep slope. So we have a gradual slope first, and then we have a steep slope. Okay, here's another image of what that might look like. If we had, let's say a meadow, you would see contour lines very far apart. And this is kind of what you would see. So you're still gaining elevation, but it's over a long distance. So it's a gradual slope instead of a steep slope. All right, so another rule for contour lines is that they do not cross each other. Okay, so a 2200 elevation cannot cross a 2300 elevation. That doesn't make sense. At that crossing point, you're saying that there are two different elevations at that point. So contour lines never actually cross. Okay, but they do form isolated hills. So in general, you will see a closed loop, especially on a very basic map. But on the more complicated maps, like the quadrangles, sometimes you can't see the actual end of the loop. So it gets truncated or cut off. Or the landscape is so large that the closed loop never actually occurs on the very small map that you're looking at. All right, looking at the rule of Vs. So this has to do with stream flow. So water obviously does not flow uphill, it flows downhill. But on a map, sometimes it's really hard to find the actual contour lines and read what the elevations are. And if you can't read the elevations on a map, then it, you need something else to help you determine which way is downhill. So we use something called the rule of Vs to determine whether a stream is flowing north, south, east, or west. Okay, so here we have a stream, okay? And that stream, you can't tell as of right now whether it flows south or it flows north. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how you can figure that out. You see how these lines here, these contour lines, are actually being in one direction? Okay, that direction tells you which way the stream is flowing. So water flows, whoops, water flows opposite the V. So imagine you have a V in your topography. Water is gonna flow out of the V, okay? So water is flowing in a south direction here rather than a north or northeast direction. Okay, so remember the rule of Vs is where the contour lines are Ving together at the point of a stream and the V points upstream. The water flows downstream out of the V. Okay, so that's the rule of V. Determining hill elevations when you don't have an exact elevation can be done if you have the, the nearest uh, contour line elevation. So you would use the maximum possible elevation, which would be the next contour line that's not represented, and then subtract one. So let me demonstrate. So here on this hill, we have one contour line that's 50, then let's go to 60, 70, 80. The next contour line would be what? 90, right? So if the next contour line is 90, but it doesn't exist on the map, that means that the next possible maximum elevation on the map, or in this particular location, would be one subtracted from 90, which would be 89, right? So 89 would be the maximum possible on this hill because 90 foot contour lines don't exist on this hill, okay? So if we looked at this map, you can pinpoint a couple of different locations where we have hills and try to determine what they are. So we have a contour interval of 20 meters, okay? So let's start with the small one here. So we have 100 meters here for elevation. And if the contour interval is 20, then as we move up, we move up 20. So here we have 100. So this next line here would be 120. 
140, 160, and then there's no more lines. So the next line would be 180, but it's not represented. So the hill is 180 minus 1, which is 179. Okay. Now moving over here to this one, we have an elevation of 200 here. Next elevation on this line is 220. And then what doesn't exist is the 240. So 240 minus 1 is 239. Right, and then over here we have 300, 320, 340, 360, 380. So the next one would be 400. 400 subtract 1 would be 399. All right, so then we also have depressions, which are low points in the map. So not only do we have hills, we also have depressions. So these may show an actual depression in the landscape, maybe a crater or a sinkhole. And the contour lines are usually denoted by hash year marks. So you have a line, a contour line, and then the little hash marks on the inside that point towards the depression. Okay, and the elevation of the first depression, oops, cut off a little bit, contour line is the same as the lowest regular contour near it. So the contour line that has the hash shears or the dash marks on them, that is a repeated elevation of the previous one. So let me kind of show you what I mean here. So if on a map this was a depression line here, it would be the same elevation as the one before it. It's not representing a whole other contour line. So for depressions, trying to figure out what the lowest point would be, we do something similar as we do with the hill. So we take the closest contour line that would be next, but we add one instead of subtracting. So for example, here we have 90, then we go down to 80, 70, 60. The next contour line that's not represented here would be 50, right? So if this is 50, we just add one. So that is the lowest possible elevation of this depression without representing the 50 foot contour line on the map. Okay, so that would be 51. Okay, so if we did some practice here and we said that this depression line here is 800 and then this contour is 760, that's a difference of 40. So 760, the next contour line would be 720, right? So if the next contour line is 720, then this lowest depression would be 721. Oh, it's not marked, but it would be 721. All right, so some more rules of depressions, not only trying to figure out what their elevation would be, but trying to recognize what type of depression it would be. So if we see something that's on the top of a hill, and it's a depression, a lot of times these are craters, like from volcanic eruptions, you would see a repetitive elevation. So as you move up the hill on one side, you'll have a repeat elevation and then it'll go down. And then as you come back out, you'll see another repetitive elevation. Okay, and that's just to recognize that you have sort of this slope um, downward. Okay, so you have a repetition on your map. If it's on the side of a hill, you see a repetition on the um, downhill side, but not on the uphill side. So on the uphill side, it starts to just continue to go up instead of kind of come up out of the depression and then go back down again. Okay, so repeat on one side indicates side of a hill. Repeat on both sides indicates the top of the hill. All right, and then we also have benchmarks. So when we are looking at a map, oftentimes there will be specific elevations noted and those are our benchmarks. So benchmarks mark a particular or exact elevation in a particular spot. And in real life, you'll see some of these little um, medallions that are in rocks that the USGS has put out. Um, so that denotes that you're on a benchmark on a map and that also helps you if you're hiking or something, decide where you are on the map. Okay, and usually these numbers are kind of strange. They're not even numbers. So this one's 14,258 feet and it happened to be taken in 1955, which is kind of cool. So sometimes you'll see these little um, triangles with a plus sign in them, sometimes there'll be X, and sometimes you'll see a BM next to it on the map. Okay, so on this map, you can see there's one here near Steerage Rock. 
So Steerage Rock has an elevation of 1,205 feet. Okay, um, there is an X over here on the left-hand side near the road, so that one's 998 feet. Um, and there isn't a BM example in here, but you will see some in your lab. Oh, here's a BM. So we have a BM here, and that one's 2,296 feet. So BM is benchmark, X is benchmark, and then these little triangles are also benchmarks. So remember, those are exact elevations at an exact point. All right, so then we get into scale. So scales are really important because we don't necessarily look at maps on a one-to-one -one scale with the real world, right? We have to shrink that down. And not every map is the same, but a lot of the um, quadrangles that we look at will be the same. Most of them are on um, a one to 24,000 scale. So the scale is usually found at the bottom of the map. And um, a lot of times there's a bar scale. So the bar scale is this guy here that kind of denotes, okay, so from this point to this point, this is a mile. Or from this point to this point, this is a half a mile. And then we have feet and kilometers as well. And then we also have the ratio scale, which is the one to 24,000. Okay, so graphical or um, bar scale are these bars that actually say, okay, so if this is, let's say, four inches, then that means that on this map, when you move four inches on the map, you're moving a mile in the real world. Okay. Okay, so again, numerically would be this bar scale here. And then we also have a fraction scale. So the fraction or ratio scale will be something like 1 to 63,360, right? That's you know an extreme scale. The one we looked at previously was 1 to 24,000. And this says that for one inch on the map, there's 63,360 inches that you're moving in real life. So this is a unit to unit comparison. If you are looking at something called the verbal scale, the verbal is just writing that out. So a lot of these maps will not actually have a full verbal scale on them um, because they use the ratio scale and then it's implied as long as you know how to read the map properly. So verbally would be one inch on the map equals 63,360 inches in the real world. So that being said, you wouldn't necessarily see, on them, see that on the bottom of a map because a lot of maps try to save room and space, so they just include this ratio scale or the numeric scale. All right, so something else that you might see on your map is something called a magnetic declination. That's usually towards the bottom of the map as well. And this tells you how far on a particular place that you are on Earth, the magnetic North Pole is from the geographic North Pole. Um, true North and magnetic North are different. We'll talk more about that with plate tectonics, but they do not line up exactly. Okay, so there is a degree difference, and depending on where you are on Earth, there is a different degree difference. So on your map, it will tell you what that is. A lot of this area is somewhere between 13 and 17 degrees. And so the reason that's important is because when you're trying to map out where you are or navigate, you usually are using a compass. And on that compass, you need to know how far magnetic north is from true north. So true north is what the north arrow is on the map. And then there will be something that oftentimes says MN, or magnetic north, with an arrow kind of like this away from it. So like you see here, this would be your true north. And your magnetic north would kind of point like this. And it would say, okay, this is 15 degrees difference. So the reason that you need to know what that difference is, is because compasses rely on the magnet magnetism of Earth, or the magnetism of the North Pole. And if you don't have your compass set to the correct magnetic declination, you won't actually know where magnetic North is. So it's really important to make sure that you um, pay attention to the magnetic declination and adjust your compass accordingly. So here it would be on a map, so we have true north, which is the star, and then the magnetic north is here, and it tells you for this particular map, it's 19 degrees difference. And so you would just adjust it on your compass, and then you know exactly where you're going. All right, the last thing we're gonna talk about is gradient. So this is a little bit of math, not too intense, but gradient is basically the slope of a hill, right? 
So how quickly are you changing vertical distance over a particular um, horizontal distance? So this is just like rise over run on a graph. So gradient is the change in the field value or the change in the elevation of your points over the distance between those points, the horizontal distance. So if we had a trail that was four miles long and the beginning of the trail is at the 1,060 foot contour line and the end of the trail is at the 960 foot contour line, how, um, sorry, how fast are you gaining elevation or what is the gradient of the trail? So if we take that, our distance um, vertically is the 1,060 minus the 960, and then our distance horizontally is 4 miles. So if we put that into our calculation, 1,060 minus 960 over 4 miles would be 25 feet per mile. So for every mile, you are gaining an elevation, or losing elevation in this case, of 25 feet. All right, and that's it, and I'll see you in the next one.